Hello, and welcome to the second part in this mini-series in the Beyond Intermediate tutorial on threads. In the first part, we had a basic introduction to threads with the underscore thread low-level API. In this tutorial, we'll be covering the threading module, which is an API at a higher level, but whose implementation is with the underscore thread low-level module. Let's learn how to use the threading module so that when we reach part three of this series, we can start to write some fully fledged programs, including some threaded servers and building from scratch functionality that threads themselves don't supply through the threading module, but which you'll find invaluable when writing software in production. Let's jump straight in and import thread and lock classes from the threading module. There are two ways that you write threads with the threading module. Let's explore the first way, which is subclassing from thread. Here, our learner class has subclassed from thread, and then we're defining the dunder init initialization function. There are four parameters passed. Self refers to the instance that's created, and then we have id, count, and mutex following on from the examples that we explored in part one. We define our instance variables and assign to them the values that we're going to pass when instantiating learner class. One thing we need to do here is run what is essentially the initialization code in the parent class in the parent class's dunder init method. You'll notice that this is done here by referring to the parent class and then dunder init. This can cause problems which we don't have time to explore here, but which we will cover in a later lesson. What you should take home at this point is any parent class initialization that needs performing should be done with the super method. When you subclass from thread, you need to override the run method. This is the code that will run when you start any thread created from this class. Here, we'll iterate over the number that's passed into count, and then we'll use the feature of context managers in Python, which you ought to have come across, but if you haven't, give a shout out in the comments and I can cover this as well. In this context, we're going to print an f string, the id, which essentially is our way of understanding which thread, and the values produced when range self.count is iterated over, self.count referring to the value in the instance here. Of course, self.count makes it refer to the instance's count. We'll define one mutex, one mutually exclusive object, and the way to do this in in the threading module is to call the lock class. We make an empty list, threads, and now it's time to run our code. We create instances of learner class with the value of i, that is 0 to 9, and then we'll count to 100, and our lock is provided in standard out mutex. Each instance of learner class that we create in this way will append to our list. You can see that I've obviously made a typo here, because what we're seeing is the thread id, but we're not seeing the count. And this is my error in writing the f string. With f strings, any code that you want to be run has to be in curly braces. I omitted the curly braces from i, therefore we just had i printed as opposed to the value of i. Let's correct that. And we can see that each thread counts to 99, i.e. range 100. As we expect now with threads in this way, the order of the thread id can be any which way. Here we've ended with thread 6. When we have a look at the threads that we created that we appended to threads, we can see the wrapper of the class for each instance. It's not vital to know what this means, but a little curiosity goes a long way. So let's have a look at the source code for the threading module. Clearly what was appended to our threads list was the wrapper of the class for each instance. So let's search for wrapper. Our search for wrapper has unintendedly taken us to the thread class. While we're here, we can see the init method that we called from our subclass init method. And here we come to the wrapper of the class. We can see that this fits exactly with what we have in our list. We have learner class, which is the instance dot dunder class dot dunder name. Take my word for it that self dot underscore name gives us thread and then a unique number given to the thread. But there's a second number in our wrapper, which could be confusing. And it's defined here 
as the status. Our status is stopped and then the second number. Because our threads have stopped, the status here becomes equal to the string stopped. This line here, if self dot underscore ident is not none, then we have stopped equals stopped plus a space and then self dot underscore ident. When we look in the documentation, we see that the underscore ident is purely for the Python interpreter to work. It's involved in the real underbellies of the Python interpreter, which we need not concern ourselves with. Anyway, after that brief tangent, let's get back to our code. Here we run the join method for each thread in threads. We'll cover join in much greater detail in part 3, when join is called without any arguments. It essentially blocks the calling thread, i.e. the thread that has called join, until the thread whose join method is called terminates. When an argument is given to join, the argument is the timeout, so you can set a timeout for waiting. This won't make much sense without an example, but the example that I want to show you join with is so exciting, but requires you to understand the material in part 2, so I've decided to hold off on that example until part 3. You won't be disappointed, trust me. So here all is well, and we print main thread exiting. Let's just take a look at the standard out mutex for a second. If we call dir on standard out mutex, but call it with our special pro tip to filter out all of the dunder methods, we can see what's available to us. Acquire, acquire lock, locked, locked lock, release, release lock. It's not immediately apparent what these do. Acquire locks the thread. Locked can be called to find out whether the thread is locked or not. So here we've locked it and it gives true. When we release with the release method, it's unlocked. And when we call locked, it's false. The methods with underscore or lock at the end are obsolete. They're just different ways of calling acquire, release, locked. And when we run help, we get the incredibly useful doc strings. If you're not doing that already, it's a very good way of getting intimate with your code. For the next example, we'll write a very basic countdown. We take n, when n is greater than naught, we print n, we do n minus 1, and then we sleep for a second. The second way of creating a thread is simply to call the thread class, as opposed to subclassing it. The function that we want to run is given to target, and then the arguments we pass in positional order to args. However, it has to be as a tuple for some strange reason. So if we want to do countdown with n equal to 10, we do target equals countdown, args equals 10 as a tuple. Let's take that code and put it in a pi file. With the isAlive method, we can see whether the thread is running or not. So here, if our thread is alive, we print still running, otherwise it's complete. So when we run our program again, we see the countdown, but obviously the code runs from top to bottom, left to right. So after 10, we have still running, because at that point in time, the thread is still running. We can demonstrate isAlive being called on a thread that is isn't running by changing the sleep time in the function countdown to 0.1 so it will sleep for 0.1 seconds and then in the main body of this file we'll sleep for 3 seconds. That's overkill and will give us plenty of time after the thread has stopped running and sure enough when we run this we have 10 to 1 countdown and then after 3 seconds has elapsed from the time of the code being run we have complete because at that point in time the thread has completed.
For our next example, we'll introduce Q, the Q module. The Q module provides the Q class, which is a very handy first in first out object that handles all the locks for us and provides a great way of having a producer of data and having a consumer of data. It's not hard to think about when that would be useful. Here in our producer, what we'll do is we'll take two arguments. The first one is the Q and the second one is N. And what we're going to do is incredibly basic. We'll run an infinite loop and then for I in range a million, what we'll do is we'll have data equal to N times I from range. If N is one, we'll just print naught to 999,999. The way we use queues is with the put and get methods. Here we'll take our queue and we'll put some data in it. With our consumer function, we'll take the queue as a parameter, we'll run an infinite loop and we'll get the data with the get method and then we'll print the data that we've got. We use one instance of queue. The same instance of queue will be used by the producer and the consumer. We'll have two threads and we'll instantiate them with the second way of producing threads that we discussed, not by subclassing. We'll have n equals to one to make this really easy. And when we run this, sure enough, we have our interpreter printing naught. And if I let it run for long enough, 999,999. I hope you've enjoyed part two of this introduction to threads. We've now learnt enough to do some really cool things. So stay tuned for part three, where we'll be writing some really nice code and demonstrating some really neat uses of threads. If you've enjoyed this and other videos of mine, please do subscribe and like and let your colleagues know, let your friends know. That will really help keep this viable and ensure that I can continue to bring you lots of intermediate Python and beyond.